Call of Duty Black Ops 3 is the 12th game in the mainline Call of Duty franchise. And those of you who ever enjoyed South Park, Family Guy, Spongebob, The Simpsons, or pretty much any other TV show, you know that after season 10 is when a series starts to lose its mojo. Yeah, baby! Such is the case with Black Ops 3. Well, what sort of background info do we need to know about this enhanced mobility shooter? Well, it was the second game made within Activision's three-year development cycle, the first being Advanced Warfare. So with an extra year in the bag, you'd expect it to benefit greatly and iron out any and all problems that the previous games might have had, right? But if you thought that, you'd be WRONG! There's so much wrong with Black Ops 3, but at the same time, it does things well. I've never been so conflicted with a COD game before, and that's why, for the first time, I'm not doing a bad review, or even an awesome one. I'm doing a mediocre review. <sighs> I guess you can make mediocre jokes in the comments section below, that's what I deserve. But watching the trailers, I could tell something was up. The reveal was just so damn generic. Little did I realize that being generic would be the least of Black Ops 3's problems. The single player would show the startling reality that the developers simply didn't know where to take the series anymore. Or at least it showed they didn't know how to structure it properly. But this trailer? The Ember Tease? That's another story. Take a look. This one sentence is packed with so many possibilities for powerful storytelling. It comes across like a war quote. The type you'd see when you died in older Call of Duty games. So why isn't the fucking story about this? This is like the Halo 5 trailers with Lock and Chief. Expertly made, vivid, memorable, iconic. Everything the story should have been, but wasn't. Black Ops 3 was still a very successful game, what'd you expect, as damn near every entry in the franchise is. But was the success warranted? Did this game sell off brand recognition in the Black Ops name? How can I even begin to describe its campaign? Did Black Ops 3 innovate in good ways like the first two games? And would the Zombies mode continue to cater to the hardcore fans and leave casuals in the dust? Well, let's... Uh, what the heck is happening? Um... Alright, let's... Let's go in... What the fuck? What, what is going on? What... Uh, Alright. And, and then we're gonna... Okay, I did not take any mushrooms today. What the shit? Fuck it, let's just take every drug known to man, go on a spiritual journey, and try to understand what in God's name is happening. You might not believe me when I say this, but I got an inside scoop into the behind the scenes of the development of Black Ops 3. What one of Treyarch's employees told me was how the game was pitched in the board meeting. It went a little something like this. Hey kids, did you like Call of Duty World at War? Did you love Black Ops 1? Did you love Black Ops 2? Well then, you're gonna fucking hate Call of Duty Black Ops 3. Okay, so this didn't really happen. I don't want to get sued, but Jesus Christmas, it might as well have. Not since Paper Mario Sticker Star and Halo 4 have I seen a sequel that deviates from what people loved about a series like Black Ops 3. What do I mean? Well, shit, it's gonna take some time to explain. But let's start with the single player campaign. The story is a complete disaster. It affects my psychological state of mind. Well, it begins with you choosing a gender, and Black Ops 3 makes a statement that there are only two. Aha, I knew it. Tumblr users and Polygon writers, make a note of this if you haven't. We're going to need you to complain endlessly about this minute detail of absolutely no importance. The opening cutscene tells us that bio-augmentation has become commonplace in the world. And there's been a disaster? What? Oh no! Superstorms, destroyed buildings, displaced residents, oh my god. When you give me the information this way through flat exposition, guess what? I don't care. We may not always see our enemies, but they are out there. And we'll never understand why they're our enemies or what their goals are. So then we're introduced to Hendrix, who just keeps piling on the exposition. And then we're dropped into Ethiopia of all places. All right. And Hendrix is pulling a bait and switch to shoot down a helicopter. Now here's the first of our recurring problems with the story. At this point, I don't really know why I'm here. This is Egyptian Minister Saeed, taken hostage by NRC forces two days ago. Why are we fighting the NRC? What is the NRC? What do they do and what does their name stand for? Who's this Minister Saeed guy? Why is he important? 
Why are we going to rescue him? Why was he captured in the first place? How come he doesn't make an appearance in any other mission but this one? Try and go boom. Black Ops 3 has the most butt fucking confusing campaign in the series, and it's partially because the game constantly drops us into these conflicts without establishing the basics. Look at the last two Black Ops games. It's pretty clear early on what you're doing and why. Alex is being interrogated for information about the numbers. Now we don't know why the numbers are so important at this moment, but it gives us a clear goal for the entire game. The numbers, basically. What do they mean? And so everything Alex is interrogated about is meant to reveal the events that led to this point. Even though it swaps between multiple characters and time periods, this story is engaging, fun, and easy to follow, and it explains everything near the end. Same thing for Black Ops 2. It switches between time periods, yet it's not jarring at all because your goals are always clear. Right now, a billion people believe that Raul Menendez is their savior. You better take him out pretty fucking quick. I think I'm gonna coin the term Halo 5 Syndrome, because this is the type of writing that Battlefront 2 EA had, Halo 5 had it, and now Black Ops 3. There is always a disconnect between your character, what you're doing, and why. And this makes it impossible to get invested in the events of the game. Anyway, so we go to find Minister Saeed, we get to look at other prisoners being tortured, you know, we swap through cameras and it's pretty cool. But as I just explained, who are these prisoners? Why are they here? What connection do they have to Hendrix, Taylor, me, Saeed, Khalil? So we head up an elevator, get trapped by NRC forces, and then we're saved by this guy called Taylor. Then Hendrix and Taylor have a mundane conversation at a very inappropriate time. You look different. You still seeing Rachel? Yeah, dude, you still seeing Rachel? Tell me about your relationship after we just murdered 70 people and there's still warm corpses are lying all around us. Are you, are you still fucking that bitch or what, man? There's more shooting, more dialogue, and then, whoa, robots. What is this, Terminator? I, robot? Then Taylor and Hendrix start arguing about your cliche, Hey, we need to save those other people. But it's not part of our orders. You suck. Alright, fine. We'll rescue them. Then we're dropped into the most pff, ridiculous turret section I've ever seen. I'll talk about gameplay and action later, but holy shit, this thing shoots explosive rounds or something. Either that or everything in Ethiopia is constructed out of dynamite. Look at how batshit crazy this section is. Some other stuff happens, and as our characters move into evac, we get ambushed by robots. Oh god damn! Oh my, oh, oh Jesus, this is brutal. I don't know. Oh god, I don't know if I can watch this. With our character losing his limbs and left to die and bleed out, the mission ends. But it turns out we were rescued by Taylor and went under the operating table to save our life and give us the cybernetic enhancements that Black Ops 3 is based around. Taylor. Yeah. Do you know what's happening to you? I'm playing a shitty game? So once again, the game starts dropping all these names and locations we know nothing about. Coalescence Corporation, the Winslow Accord, the 54 Immortals, etc. And Taylor informs us of the technology known as DNI, which is a pretty cool concept. It's a system that is surgically implanted into people that allows them to interact and take control of other technological systems. This includes hacking terminals, disabling drones, and a variety of other neat little tricks. DNI also allows a person to link their mind with another, experience what they've experienced. This connection through DNI can last hours, days, weeks, months, but in real time happens within a few moments. It's a pretty interesting concept that we'll talk about later. So then we appear on a train, and we start talking to Taylor about the technology and dreams and that sort of thing. The plot of Black Ops 3 in this whole train sequence borrows a lot of ideas from the movie Source Code. A really good movie, by the way, which is all about a guy who has to go back in time over and over again until he can save a train from blowing up. Sound familiar? In Black Ops 3, we're told that terrorists blew up the train. Uh, who these terrorists were, what their names are, <laughs> what their objective was, who gives a shit? But what it does explain to the audience is... Train go boom. And it, and it sums up the campaign and story perfectly. We've got this vast, cool, futuristic universe with mind games, DNI, drones, war bots, futuristic weapons, a society dependent on technology, and how do we explain it all to the audience? Train go boom. Essentially, the second mission is here to teach us about DNI, our new abilities, introduce us to some characters we won't end up caring about, and set the stage for the technological warfare we're about to experience.
one thing I noticed right away was the player character whose name in the subtitles is is literally player. So that's what I'm going to call him. Player is probably the most unrelatable protagonist we've seen in the series. Every time he talks, I want to ingest copious amounts of cyanide. Something about his voice actor just rubs me the wrong way, and I can't ever take him seriously because his dialogue is written so horribly. She's messing with my mind! What about what's going on in that pinhead of yours?! Who you calling pinhead? And he acts like everything is such a big fucking deal when he has no reason to be invested in any of it. And therefore, neither do I. That's enough, Hendrix! That's enough, Hendrix! So then our next objective is to hunt down some random terrorist in a hoodie, who's who's not even given a name, dude. Besides, he's a fucking terrorist. Durka Allah, Muhammad Jihad. Anyways, we head to Singapore to investigate some missing CIA operatives. And from here we learn that Taylor and his group are the last ones here. So player Hendrix and Kane connect the dots and assume he's responsible for killing, like, six dudes. Apparently this is enough motivation for the rest of the game to revolve around tracking down and killing Taylor and his team. And we're just gonna gloss over the fact that we've killed about 800 people up to this point. So Taylor is supposed to be our villain. The problem is we never actually have a concrete reason to hate him or stop his evil plans, whatever those might be, or if he even has any. There was never a moment where I was rooting for a player and the other characters to overcome a challenge, or where I was cheering them on to take down a villain, and when I was happy when they succeeded. In fact, this game doesn't really have a villain. Taylor, Hendrix, the 54 Immortals, none of them are tangible because we hardly see them do anything bad, and when we do, we don't understand why, because the game doesn't tell us. What motivates the 54 Immortals? What, what, they're just drug and weapon dealers? Okay, why do they hate the Winslow Accord? Matter of fact, what's the Winslow Accord? What is it trying to accomplish? Why is there an uprising in Cairo? And what's the end goal of it? What is anything? Try and go boom. Raul Menendez was a bad guy you could see. He was always there to fuck your day up. You witnessed him doing terrible things to characters you liked. He killed people, manipulated them. You understood his motivations and where his burning hatred came from, even if you couldn't relate to it. Raul was an antagonist you wanted to take down. So why did Taylor kill these CIA operatives? Because a voice in his head told him to? I guess? Here comes the Y'all don't really want it like Boom. Reason and motivation, people. Black Ops 3 has none of it. In fact, the game has barely any connection at all to the previous entries. Raul Menendez is mentioned in a couple throwaway lines and Nova 6 Gas makes an appearance for some reason. And there's a line reminiscent of what Hudson said in the first game. Give us what we want, we'll guarantee your safety. Give yourself up, and I will personally guarantee your safety. But honestly, there's no reason for this game to be called Black Ops 3. It only gives the false impression that it's going to build off the stories we liked and experienced before. I just don't care about the people in the story, because I don't understand what's driving them. It's another classic case of show don't tell. We can't be shown how the world is affected by all this technology, these disasters, and what role all these factions play in it. We have to be told about it. Like it's a fucking boring history lesson. I don't give a shit about your uprising. Yeah, you said it, Hendrix. That's exactly how I feel. Hey, remember that scene in the original Modern Warfare when we witnessed a fucking nuke going off? Yeah, it's one of the most memorable scenes in gaming history. It was almost like we were there. Witnessing disaster or being told about a disaster? Which one do you prefer more in a video game? The game shows people getting killed and whatnot, but we aren't given a reason to sympathize with them because we don't have a character that represents or relates to the people who are suffering. Let me explain what I mean, and this applies to all forms of storytelling. See, in Avatar The Last Airbender, we've got the main character Aang, who wakes up hundreds of years late after fleeing from his destiny to bring balance to the world. The story shows and tells us his tragic history. And because he tries to maintain this positive, upbeat, carefree attitude, we sympathize with Aang as he's just trying to enjoy his childhood. But if we never saw him reminisce about his past, if we never saw him come to the realization that all his people are dead, as a direct result of him forsaking his duty, we wouldn't care about the airbenders because nobody would be affected by their demise on a personal level. The reason we give a shit about the airbenders is not just because Aang is the last one, but because we care about Aang. I really am the last airbender.
At no point in Black Ops 3 is there any sort of emotional connection or attachment created between us and the other characters, or between the other characters themselves. You might say, oh, Taylor and Kane had some romantic interest, but we have no idea what that interest was or why they loved each other, why they cared about each other at all. They all talk like something big is at stake, whether it's the CIA safe houses being leaked to their enemies, or war breaking out, or a huge disaster. But it's all just so distant. Another one of the biggest issues with Black Ops 3's story is the way it treats violence. Now I know in regards to Call of Duty, you might not think this is true, but it is. Violence is a tool. It's a means of telling a story, and when it's not treated that way, that's when we get the real shit. So when you watch the Normandy invasion and in Saving Private Ryan, whether you realize it or not, the extreme violence is being used as a way to ground the story in the setting of World War II and show you how fucked up it was. You get an idea of how horrific war truly is to the point where it's hard to watch, and even harder for you to put yourself in the shoes of a soldier on that beach. Aside from the scene where the player gets mutilated by a robot, Black Ops 3 treats violence as a spectacle, nothing more than shock value. Now contrast this masterpiece of a scene with some of the violence in Black Ops 3. Well, there's a part where the 54 Immortals are capturing people and Hendrix tells us they run a slave trade. The Immortals run a well-established trade in human flesh. Okay, so what happens next? They're just gonna leave them- to what Oh. Oh, I guess slaves are more valuable if you blow their fucking heads off. But seriously, what, what was the point of this scene? Are we supposed to hate the 54 Immortals because they just killed a couple random civilians? What are we meant to feel? I don't fucking know. Similarly, there's a point where Go Jijong, whatever her name is, leader of the 54 Immortals, gets her hand cut off and then her face is melted and it's like, who was this character again? What does any of this accomplish? Now compare any violent depictions in this game to Black Ops 2. Again, Raul Menendez doesn't shoot off people's kneecaps and slit their throats for no reason. He does it because he has a burning hatred within him and an unquenchable desire to see the people who destroyed everything he loves brought down to his level. Some men just want to watch the world burn. So with characters we have no desire to connect with, a poorly explained plot told through tedious exposition, a futuristic setting that's as distant as the stars in the sky, and an unclear villain with motivations we can't understand, Treyarch starts throwing all this weird shit at us on top of everything. In addition to all the tragedies that are going on, apparently there's also a, a virus called Corvus infecting people's DNIs and causing them to lose themselves and do crazy shit. And that's that's why Taylor killed those CIA operatives? I I guess? Train go boom. Well, in the second half of the game, we get transported to the Frozen Forest, a place constantly referenced to the point of absurdity. And so we walk through it, and it's pretty goddamn cool. We find a baby? What the hell? Is that about? All right, so when we connect with Sarah Hall, we get taken back to World War II because she studied it. This is Bastogne. I studied it at the Academy. I cited it in my final paper. And we're like living through her memories, but she was never there, and everyone is still using guns from the year 2080? Like, what the fuck is happening? What in God's name is going on? If nothing more to showcase that we can experience other people's memories, why not choose something that indulges us and reveals something about Sarah Hall's character? Why isn't the game using this opportunity to do cool things and establish some kind of theme or moral or tone that encapsulates the story as a whole? Or connect it to the other games in the series? It makes no sense! And, uh, it, and then we start fighting zombies? In the single player campaign? What kind of drugs were they on when they made this crap? Alright, so let's just skip to the ending and the twist because nothing else is really important. I could bitch and moan about it all day. Alright, so the twist is after you got mutilated by that robot, after undergoing surgery to get the DNI placed in you, you died shortly after. And would you guess where this was revealed? At the end of the game? <laughs> no. It was revealed in the fast scrolling text that's basically unreadable in this report by John Taylor at the start of the game. And so the twist is, everything you're doing, you're doing in John Taylor's shoes. Now, to be fair, Black Ops 3 arguably has the best and most interesting premise of any Call of Duty campaign, that the events of the story are being experienced by the player through interfacing with John Taylor and reliving his memories while your character in real life lays in the medical bay awaiting surgery, and that in real time, 
We experience all of John Taylor's memories leading up to this point and that of his crew in only a few moments before the character dies. That's so cool! But the problem is, when you hide critical plot points, twists, and characters within a comic book or scrolling text that flies by too fast, you either have to look up an explanation on the internet, or you record the footage or find some way to slow it down and pause it so you can read. Now in a game series with mass market appeal to mostly casual audiences, yeah, no shit people aren't going to understand your story. I mean, there are some cool things about it. Throughout the game, characters are trying to keep you focused on what's happening. Hey. Still with us? Stay with me. Hendrix, you still with me? You still in there? Hey. You still with us? Taylor. Are you still with me? They keep like snapping their hey. fingers and saying, hey, you with me? You still Almost with like us? a paramedic yeah. trying to keep you awake, trying to keep you so alive good. and conscious, away from the light. And the concept of the frozen forest being a place to comfort you before death is interesting as balls. The idea that the final mission is the player's mind finding closure before death. The ideas here are just so brilliant, but the execution is missing. Now while the complexity is intriguing, the visceral imagery fucks with your head in a good way and makes you question what's really happening, despite having all the answers now, my question for you is, what was the point? I don't know. I don't know why this story was told. I don't know what I was supposed to get out of it, aside from a brain fuck moment when I looked it up online and realized the truth. I don't know what I was supposed to feel. What Black Ops 3 should have done is had Taylor write a journal about his experiences, his missions, and his descent into feeling like an expendable piece of technology. This would give an overall message about how in the future humans might be looked at as just another tool, to be augmented and used for the gain of an organization or group. It could have explored the ideas of how far will technology take us before we become disconnected from reality, the more we use and rely on it. The ultimate twist at the end should have been something Taylor talked about in this journal, so the audience wouldn't be forced to fucking look it up. You know, he'd lament the fact that the player died so quickly and would end on the note of him wondering what our last moments were like, and if we experienced anything. So the point of the story would have been a tragic tale of a soldier who got wounded in battle and had hope that technology could save him. But while it doesn't save his life, the DNI technology allows him to find comfort and closure in a way that would have been impossible without it. And when you apply this idea to all the millions of soldiers in this universe, then it ends on a pretty depressing note. And that would have stuck with us. But instead it all comes off as forced with nothing really memorable except... Try and go boom. Black Ops 3's story exemplifies creative writing but poor storytelling. The ideas and concepts are brilliant, but the vague and ambiguous presentation makes it incomprehensible to the average player. We can't get attached to the characters. I couldn't describe any of their personalities to you, let alone what each one of them is supposed to represent or what they wanted. Despite how great the graphics are, how unique and aesthetically pleasing these sections are, and how cool it is to experience these mind games, and see mountains moving all around and shit, despite all the crazy awesome imagery and psychedelic nature of the story. The problem with these sections is none of them make any sense when you're playing through them. So it feels pointless. It lacks substance. When you compare this game to Black Ops 1, the flaws are exemplified. Sure, the story jumps around all the time, but at the end of each mission, we're taken back to the present, real time. Back to the interrogation room. It explored themes about covert black operations, what lengths countries and organizations will go to to achieve their goals. It explored the idea of brainwashed soldiers and how key phrases or a number sequence could be implanted in people in order to control them. The twist at the end made sense because the game showed you what was actually happening, and there were little details spread throughout that gives you those aha moments when you think about them. Nothing was confusing. It all came together at the end of Black Ops 1. And most importantly, we had characters we liked and wanted to see succeed, and we had villains we wanted to take down. They all grounded the story and made it feel real. No character in Black Ops 3 has this type of consistency. Their motivations are unclear and constantly changing, which makes the player second guess everything that's happening. And it takes what would otherwise be an interesting look at the psychological and technological aspects of war, and it throws it in the dumpster. Instead of a character like Alex Mason whose struggles are clear, Black Ops 3 just plays too many mind games for the story to be anything but a disappointment. 
If this was Treyarch's latest and best attempt at creating a single player campaign with an extra year under their belt, I can't say I'm shocked. They ain't gonna make one for Black Ops 4. So now that my long-winded tirade on the story is over, how's the gameplay? It stinks. It stinks. Keeping with the tradition of mediocrity, Treyarch made some cool innovations while scrapping the best parts of Black Ops 2. There is no divergent multi-layered choices or storytelling in this game. Yet it is cool we have this mini hub area prior to each mission which allows you to do things like change your appearance, look at collectibles, your service record, customize loadouts, if you care about any of that. And one thing that is interesting is the way they unify the customization, so no matter what mode you play, you're unlocking things and leveling up and getting experience points. The cosmetics you unlock through playing the campaign, multiplayer, and zombies can all be used in each one of those modes. The game allows you to create classes prior to each mission just like Black Ops 2 and it has the accolades and scoring and leaderboards as well, which is always a nice touch. But whatever you do, don't you ever, ever pick a shotgun as a starting weapon. You will get ass blasted so badly it will make you want to restart the game. Difficulty is pretty fair on Hardened. Never had any World at War grenade spam PTSD, so there's that. It's cool that we also get to fight robots, people, and all sorts of gigantic gizmos and gadgets. Boss battles are something that Call of Duty has never really done, but they're actually pretty fun here. The game does introduce some cool visor mechanics where you can highlight how far away enemies are, if the local area is hazardous, or exactly how big the blast radius is on a grenade. Then there's like a night vision mode, which does exactly what you think it would do. And these new additions really spiced up the classic Call of Duty gameplay for me. I just wish the campaign took them away from the player more often, make you rely on it at first, and then strip you of your tactical advantage. You know, it would've added some tension that way. I don't know what else to say to be honest, it's pretty generic and forgettable for the most part. It was kinda cool in the frozen forest parts, where enemies and civilians would disappear when shot, they'd appear out of thin air like it was, get this, a dream. I fucking love the way the civilians on the train just like, fall back in their seats and disappear. One line of dialogue near the beginning did stick out to me. The more abilities you have, the more fun you can have. N-n-no. No dude, it doesn't. This kinda encapsulates Treyarch's ideology on this game. The more crazy, cool, futuristic shit you can do, the better the game will be. It's funny because I rarely use these abilities as they were intended. I just went back to shooting like it was any other COD game. And that's about it, honestly. Despite some of the interesting set pieces, locations, and unique art style, we can't really get invested in the gameplay because the story is so god-awful. I'll admit, I suffered through this campaign to make this review, and I would not do it again. But how does Black Ops 3 handle its multiplayer? Well, Advanced Warfare introduced the new movement mechanics we're all fucking sick of at this point, and this game had a chance to flesh those out. However, this multiplayer is the definition of mediocre. On one side, the sliding, boosting, jetpacks, and specialist abilities give the game some flair and fun gimmicks. Tango down. I'm not gonna lie, I had fun with the multiplayer at first. Maybe because I was looking to scratch that Call of Duty itch, since I had taken a break from Call of Duty, and hadn't gotten into the multiplayer since Black Ops 1. The guns are unique, fun to use on a basic level, it's a fun game. Always enjoyable to pop some sucker out of the sky or use a specialist ability to rack up some kills, and the specialists add a bit more variety and tactics to the game, for better or worse. Although the core gameplay suffers immensely because of a few crippling flaws. And this has become especially apparent after going back and replaying Modern Warfare 2 multiplayer. In previous games, the primary weapons had clear benefits and trade-offs, and movement penalties associated with them. LMGs were bulky, slower to aim, but there was no better choice if you wanted to lock down an objective. SMGs were good for a hit-and-run style that allowed you to surprise your enemies and flank them, while assault rifles were the most balanced and the sniper class could fulfill the role of a more battle rifle type loadout or the traditional long-range marksman. Snipers are especially hurt in this game because when players can fly through the air, it's much harder to get a clean shot. Now stay with me here. When every gun has so much starting ammo, you never run out, there's no need for a scavenger perk. And because every player can fly and has unlimited sprint, there's no need for marathon or lightweight. 
Because of the slide and boosts, SMG users can get up in people's faces easier without taking a perk that helps them with that. Now because of this, the pros and cons that separated the primary weapon classes, their roles in the sandbox, and how they stack up against each other, all start to blur together. And now the movement mechanics are directly hampering the finely tuned balance that the previous games established. Recon plane acquired. You would be surprised how much depth there is to COD's multiplayer and just how swiftly Black Ops 3's design undermines that. Add on to this that the map design is pretty generic, basically just small three lane maps with some verticality. And what we have is a multiplayer mode where your choice of weapon and how you build your loadouts doesn't matter much. Because the benefits and trade-offs are so minimal. Tactical grenades are borderline useless. Again, when people are flying 30 feet in the air, you can't land a concussion grenade consistently. So why would you sacrifice a slot for it? When you play any of the COD games prior to Advanced Warfare, you know everyone's gonna be on the fucking ground. Boots on the ground. This made grenades, equipment, claymores, tacticals, grenade launchers, etc. all viable. I think wall running, jetpacks, and all this stuff has a much greater impact on COD's core multiplayer than most people realize. That's where the cracks start to form with advanced movement, and people don't seem to talk about this all that much, but it's one of the real reasons people get upset with these futuristic games. Now to be fair, there are almost no useless attachments. And, in comparison with Modern Warfare 2, this is a big upgrade. I mean, who the fuck would use a holographic sight on the AA-12? Let's be real. So in this regard, they really improved attachment choices overall. Unfortunately, despite using the cool pick 10 system from Black Ops 2, the class customization here is awful. For starters, there are five secondary guns to choose from. You gotta be fucking kidding. And I'm not talking about stupid ass melee weapons or any of that dumb shit that can't be unlocked through traditional means. Those weapons don't count because barely anybody is going to have them. But you know what? Kids nowadays have no idea how good we had it in the past. Let me, let me just take you back to a little diamond in the rough called Modern Warfare 2. Here's a little lesson in quality class customization, all right? Let's just look at our options here, hmm? You've got four machine pistols, six shotguns, four pistols, and five launchers. Uh, 19 is a better number than five, don't you fucking think? Now I'm gonna be comparing this game to Modern Warfare 2 because in my opinion, it has the best customization in the series. But it's not even an argument of quality versus quantity. This is an argument of depth. For some strange reason, I don't feel the need to put as much thought into my classes in Black Ops 3. I'm not as anal retentive about it, and it took me a while to understand why. Part of that is there aren't any significant trade-offs for taking one perk over another. There is no synchronization between what weapon class you use and what perks you use. Fuck, with such awful secondaries, three machine pistols, and two launchers, that's it. The only reason to take a secondary is if you choose a launcher to shoot down kill streaks to get your own faster. Whereas in Modern Warfare 2, you had to carefully think about what each class you created would specialize in. Here's an example. So, you really like the FAMAS, and you're probably gonna want to pick Sleight of Hand or Bling as your first perk because Modern Warfare 2 only gives you two extra clips for assault rifles. But with a burst fire weapon, you can serve ammo better, whereas if you took the Scar H or ACR, you'd want to go with Scavenger. Now, you also understand that the FAMAS has great long range capabilities with low recoil, so an ACOG scope is actually very good. But with a primary weapon more suited for medium and long range distances, because older Call of Duty games used to actually have those in their maps, you'll need a close quarters secondary. So now it's a matter of, what do you want? A weapon you can swap to in a pinch like a pistol? That might not be as reliable? Or do you want a shotgun that's a little more clunky to use but packs a bigger pot? If you rock Bling Pro, you'll probably want a pistol as the attachments for shotguns aren't as useful. What I've just described was a handful of the thought that gets put into making a single class in Modern Warfare 2. With five shitty secondaries and a majority of perks that have little impact, there's not much room for pre-game strategy and class setup in Black Ops 3. There is no wasteland map where you say, I'm gonna pick a sniper for this map. This is a major problem with the multiplayer because progression and loadouts and what you pick to play on which map is one of the series' most impactful mechanics and most meaningful decisions. 
and even though the specialist abilities can be fun, it's just another example of ordnance drops from Halo 4. So taking into account everything I've just said, what Black Ops 3's multiplayer has managed to do is take the skill out of Call of Duty and lift it in a half-empty state. Of course, because this game came out around Overwatch, Destiny, it's gotta have fucking loot boxes and dumb emotes. I can't help but cringe at the end of every multiplayer game when the characters say some dumb shit, pull out their weapon, put it back, and then do some embarrassing pop culture reference. It puts an awful taste in my mouth, and I- God. It's awful, uncool, cheesy, and just pure cringe. But the worst is the way they made the loot boxes and the drops. I don't even want to talk about this. <sighs> well, they basically loaded up these supply drops with a bunch of stupid crap. Calling cards, emotes, emblems, skins. There's so many skins, it makes the actual unlockables pretty much worthless. You get duplicates like there's no tomorrow, and we all love that. The grind is as tedious as a Dark Souls Soul Level 1 Fists Only playthrough, okay? It's fucking ridiculous. They loaded it up with weapons in an attempt to bribe you with gameplay advantages. This is why the secondary choices offend me so much. In this category, they have more weapons unlockable through supply drops than they do in the base game. And they try to offer contracts and challenges to give a placebo effect of a faster grind, but win 75 games? What the shit? Do you know how long that's gonna take me for one weapon? This is one of the most intrusive, annoying, and manipulative microtransaction systems I've ever seen in a video game. And I've been around, boy. I've been around a long time. Honestly, the only truly good thing about this game are the kill streaks, which are fucking baller. In fact, the care package might be the best because I seem to always get good shit from it. The fact that it's your score and not kills that give you streaks means the player is rewarded for playing the objective and taking down enemy kill streaks. Using UAVs, points for assists, that sort of thing. This makes for much better flow within the gameplay overall. And it doesn't fall into the pit hole that Modern Warfare 2 does where everyone is camping and trying to get their own kill streak and not play the actual objective. So there is that. The kill streaks are really fun to use and they're creative. This is where the futuristic part of Black Ops 3 shines. The dart is one of my favorites, allowing you to control a mini missile that fires smaller missiles. Or the Cerberus, which is just an overpowered beast on the ground. The Talon is fun. I love it all. While the class customization kind of sucks, it's the kill streaks in this game that kept me playing till second prestige. So while Black Ops 3's multiplayer might have the cool weapons, the awesome game modes, both new and fan favorites, while it may have incredible kill streaks, the core issues that arise from the class customization, the movement mechanics, and the way it subverts everything the series had built up to this point is what keeps it from being awesome and instead makes it mediocre. I'm basically a broken record at this point in regards to Nazi zombies. Oops, can I still say Nazi? Oh shit, don't ban me from Battlefield 5 dice, I, I'm sorry. But just like Transit in Black Ops 2, just like the Final Reich in COD World War 2, Shadows of Evil, the one and only map you get without paying money, is a tedious fetch quest. Now don't get me wrong, the map can be pretty fun when you've got people who know what they're doing, so they can take care of all that boring shit while you kill zombies and have fun. The aesthetic and sound design of Shadows is supremely good. This Lovecraftian horror vibe, tentacles and Cthulhu and all this just works so well for a zombies mode. And the starting revolver? I love it. But aside from that, the map is a complete mess. For some inexplicable reason, Treyarch thought it made the map better to have the zombies come through areas that look like repairable barricades, but aren't. It is confusing as hell. You just get surrounded so fast because you can't repair barricades and you can't remember where they're coming from because you can't repair the barricades from where they come from. So you can't anticipate the zombies coming in. You, If you shoot in the same place for two seconds, you're gonna get hit. So there aren't any good places to hold out because zombies constantly spawn all around you so you have no option but to play run and gun. And the supply drops didn't just mess with the multiplayer balance, it had to fuck with zombies too. You can literally cheat the game with gobble gums. Obviously a choice made to again sell you advantages in Zombies too. I hate this so much man, Zombies is supposed to be an arcade type experience. The first time we played it, me and my buddies were playing Kino, and one of them spawned in like four fire sales. We were at round four, and after that I said fuck it, I'm not gonna play this game with any of that cheap bullshit, cause it's not fun. Some of the gums are cool like Unquenchable allowing you to buy a fifth perk, but then there's shit like Perkaholic, or Profit Sharing, and so many others that just give 
such a blatant and unwarranted advantage that it's simply not fun or challenging to play using that shit. It just becomes RNG at that point. RNG was supposed to be left in the mystery box! So while I might have talked smack about COD World War II because of the absurd amount of customization options, Black Ops 3 isn't as confusing to me. It makes some very good innovations to the mode. As you kill zombies and get to higher rounds, you level up in this game just like what I talked about in the campaign, and you'll unlock attachments for guns in future games. You can customize the paint job, the camo, which is really cool. It gives a sort of personal feel to it. And maybe I was just triggered in COD World War II, but this seems a lot simpler to me. It's really cool to pick attachments prior to playing matches. And again, you feel like you're working towards something in Zombies, and that's something I really enjoy. As far as DLC goes, the only map I bought was Der Eisendrack, which for the most part is fun, but it still has the same problems of being a run-and-gun only type of map. The aesthetic is really cool, fighting in a castle with dragons and zombies and shit. And for the newer style of Zombies games, this is pretty good. But ironically enough, the best maps in Black Ops 3 are the simplest ones specifically from Zombie Chronicles, which all take their maps from World at War, Black Ops 1, and Origins from Black Ops 2. It's because the older maps weren't made with pay-to-win gobblegums in mind that it's entirely possible and more fun to play them without using gobblegums at all. The weapons might be different, the zombies might hit faster, and the perks may have changed, but the core fundamentals lie in the simplicity of the map design. Having played Der Rees and Ascension, Kino Der Toten, and all these maps so many times, I can't tell you how refreshing it was to play it with newer graphics, with different weapons, with attachments I could customize. That was the best part of Zombies. You know, Der Rees is always going to be a timeless map, because it's as easy as starting the game and playing, whereas Shadows of Evil is something you have to look up. And after doing the quests, Easter eggs, and all that, I've got no real desire to go back and replay it. I just want to see how long I can last, you know? I think it goes to show that no matter how straightforward and casual the maps are made, they appeal to everyone. And the same can't be said for Shadows of Evil. Without Zombie Chronicles and the remake of Der Rees, there would be absolutely no reason for me to play Zombies or give it a second thought. And though it is a very pricey DLC, I think the amount of effort that went into remastering all these classic maps makes it worth it if you're like me and just want to enjoy some good old fashioned zombies. Deadly, like my third wife, fourth, Security well, level one of my wives. So let's wrap this up by talking about the extra features. Surprisingly, while Black Ops 3 doesn't have the strongest multiplayer zombies or a campaign, Treyarch still managed to pack this game full of content. And for the most part, that's something I can really appreciate. For one, they've got this mini mode called Free Run, which is basically a time trial, speed run sort of thing. It's not much, you got four levels, but it's a neat little mode to distract you. And of course, leaderboards, because we all want to know who has the biggest dick. In addition, there's a nightmare mode, which sends you through the campaign missions with a slightly different story and with zombies replacing the normal enemies. You know, the nightmare mode looks pretty interesting. Having said what I did about the campaign, though, do I have any desire to play this? Nope! But the big draw for me is Dead Ops Arcade 2, a point of emphasis that Black Ops 2 missed out on completely. And let me tell you, this is the fun shit right here. While it looks about the same as the first one, there's a few key differences. For one, you get a map screen in between areas so there's a goal, an endpoint for the player to visualize, and an adventure leading to the end. The old school arcade style and charm is nailed with absolute perfection. This opening cutscene is glorious. Sets the tone perfectly. The graphics, sounds, music, gameplay is phenomenal. A few new power-ups are added, none cooler than this card that brings you into a first-person mode seamlessly, allowing you to take an extra hit and it makes the gameplay more dynamic. I also got this gigantic chicken mech that shoots explosive eggs, so that was pretty fucking funny. While Treyarch wasn't able to maintain the identity in any other parts of Black Ops 3, they kept it here in Dead Ops Arcade 2. And it isn't even hidden from the player this time around. You, you don't have to enter a code from the main menu, it's available from the start. Definitely some of the best dumb fun you can have with this game, casual or hardcore. And of course there is co-op too, so bring your friends! Like I said, Black Ops 3 is mostly a mediocre experience. But within these layers of extra content, it gives gamers more reasons to play. 
more options, and that is always something to be commended. Treyarch, in my eyes, almost always delivers just the right amount of content in whatever COD game they produce. And even though I hate to say it, they did it with Black Ops 3. When it comes down to the wire, Black Ops 3 is the epitome of mediocre in the Call of Duty franchise. Sure, some might see it as mostly bad, and I too lean towards that side a bit, but the difference is I can still have fun with the game despite its major flaws. Not the campaign, though. No. That shit is hot garbage, a complete mess, way more confusing than it needs to be, nor is it fun enough to warrant more than one playthrough. With just Shadows of Evil and no Zombie Chronicles, the zombies aspect wouldn't be much better either. And while the multiplayer has that emphasis on enhanced mobility, it's at least passable enough that it can be played casually from time to time, especially if you're chasing those fun kill streaks. Overall though, the cracks in this game are just too deep and wide to ignore, and despite the benefit of a three year development cycle, Black Ops 3 is proof that time doesn't give you everything, and it can't replace a lack of vision. And that is why Call of Duty Black Ops 3 was so mediocre.